Brought to you by the Rugby Outlet Mall, equipping you for freedom and connection through rugby. Find out more at RugbyOutletMall.com. Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Tommy Bailu, and this is the podcast where we speak with people about the opportunities that they've experienced, found, created, or just been a part of via rugby. We have an amazing guest today. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. Uh, they've all been favorite episodes. What can I say? I think I say this literally every week, but this is one of my favorite episodes this week. Uh, we have Adam Gray Hayward. He is the lead actor from the movie Play On. Now, if you guys don't remember Play On, this was 2010 uh, independent movie by David Story who about this guy from Scotland who is a star in Scotland, gets leaves Scotland to be able to come to America to play for the Kansas City Chiefs and ends up finding out about himself and learning about this quirky group of Kansas City rugby players. A really great story. I think you can find it on Amazon Prime or Apple Music or iTunes. But I really enjoyed having this conversation. Definitely one of the first actors from the... Rugby cinematic lexicon, and uh, I, it was great talking to him. Really down to earth guy, cool as I don't know what. And it was a really great conversation, just being able to look back and kind of understand what was going on during that time and getting to that point in the movie. So I know you guys are gonna enjoy this one. Let you guys know we got still got the sponsor Rugby Outlet Mall equipping you for connection and mobility. So we want to make sure that you guys are able to go in and I got to give a little bit of praise for some of the people who capped got a couple of our HBCU rugby classic shirts. Uh, It was really a pleasure being able to get those out and they are available and you can actually get them on discount using promo code grow rugby G R E A U X rugby and you can get 20% 20% off all clothing, at, uh, all exclusive clothing for Gift Time Rugby and HBCU Rugby Classic. And uh, we're looking to be able to start adding more and more stuff. And this is really not even just a clothing, all exclusive items that are on the Rugby Outlet Mall websites, particularly with Gift Time Rugby and uh, HBCU Rugby Classic. So I, it's, it's, it's one of those things that we're using. We want to be able to help change the game and, of course, be able to make sure that you have not just your on-field uh, leisures taken care of, but you get your casual because rugby is a culture. So we're taking care of it off the field as much as we're trying to do on the field. Actually, probably more so than we're doing on the field. And then, of course, gots to, got to, got to get you guys to go check out Singapore to Tokyo any way we can. The documentary as we two guys traverse through Southeast Asia on their way to the 2019 Rugby World Cup and the adventures that they have going through. You want to check this out. I'm telling you, it is worth the watch. $17, but it's seven episodes, 20 minutes an episode. You'll get your money's worth out of it. You'll get to learn something, and I'm telling you, it'll make you remember why you want to go travel as soon as this COVID situation is all over because you're going to want to be able to see and enjoy the things that are going on uh, around the world as much as it is, you know, how we have to deal with here in the States. So you guys check it out. You can find it at redearthfilms.vhx.tv. That is Red Earth, R-E-D-E-A-R-T-H, films, F-I-L-M-S, dot V-H-X, dot TV. I'm not going to hold you guys up too much longer. It was just another great week. We're we're going through some more stuff. Uh, just just COVID life we're, looks like very likely we may not have college rugby happening in the fall. So this is going to be interesting because a lot of universities are not allowing the sports and they're starting to shut down campuses. So this is going to be a very interesting new year. But in the meantime, in the meantime, still enjoy still enjoy and to even top it out all, all off i don't know whenever this will be listened to but on wednesday july 22nd roots rugby is going to be holding a virtual panel 
This is July 22nd, 2020. They're going to be holding a virtual panel. I'll be hosting it. And we got some great guests, and they want to be able to let you know about the resource that is Roots Rugby. And if you don't know about Roots Rugby, you can go check episode one uh, with Kyle and Tiana Granby. Episode one with Kyle and Tiana Granby. And lastly, while I'm at it, uh, please leave a review or rating. Uh, if you like it, if you hate this episode, if you like it on Apple iTunes um, or Google Play, leave a rating. We're trying to get to 10 by the end of the month. We are three up and just need seven more to go. And I really want to be able to get you guys help. I don't care if it's one stars, if it's five stars, as long as you put a rating in there, that's all I appreciate. So without further ado, I'm not going to hold us off any longer. Adam Gray Hayward from the movie Play On. Check it out. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. I got another V, I, and truly P person uh, for us today. From the film Play On. Now, I know you guys might not have fully remembered it, but it was one of those early rugby films, 2010, that we got to enjoy. It was the one that, first one I got to watch once after I started playing. We got the great, the legend, Adam Gray Hayward. <laughs> Adam, thank you for coming on today, man. Of course. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the time. <laughs> So, you know, like I said, your, that movie was actually the first rugby movie that I had watched after I started playing. So I started playing in 09. And mm. I remember whenever, like, this movie kind of popped up and it was, like, marketed and marketed. To, and it was just like, well, who, what's this independent movie? I was like, all right, let me go. Let me go ahead and check this thing out. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I enjoyed it. I was like, this is, this is it's a true independent movie. But mm. I was like... I get this. I'm all right. Nice. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was, it was incredibly fun to make. It was an incredible experience. Um, I mean, it all kind of came about very serendipitously. I mean, I was, I was bartending at the time, and a friend told me about it. I went and just met the producer at uh, – sorry, I met the producer at, at, at a hotel lobby. I met the director at a Starbucks. <laughs> and then it all, we, I had to go back to Australia, so we just kept kind of uh, – conversing over email and you know, with a time difference over phone and ended up landing the role somehow and uh the rest is history right and and it was honestly one still to this day one of the most incredible experiences of my life shooting that and for those incredible people uh traveling to these incredible places in kansas city and scotland so something i'll treasure forever dude i love that i love that so before we kind of go in further, because I do definitely have questions, uh, sure. I kind of want to get it from the start, you know, for you. You already mentioned coming out from Australia, but the one I, question I always like to ask is, how do you personally get started in that connection to rugby? And subsequently, how did it all start working out? How did this all start for you? Yeah, sure. I mean, growing up in Australia, obviously rugby is like uh, baseball or basketball for Americans. I mean, it's just it's, it's second nature. Uh, and so when I moved here, I was 14, and at the time, rugby wasn't what it was now, or what it is now. Um, so I got into American football because it was the closest or next best thing. Right. Uh, and loved it. Um, I feel like I did quite well with it. So I got the opportunity to continue on from high school and play in college down in San Diego. And um, during my time there, I became good friends with, with the guys on, the, on their club rugby team. And I always thought it just looked like so much fun. Um, I always thought I'd love to get out there and play with you guys, but um, due to you know certain restrictions, I wasn't allowed to. And then after my last year of football, which would have been, what, 2004, mm -hmm. I just decided to postpone one of my classes for graduation so I could stay that extra spring semester and play one semester of rugby. And, and I kid you not, it was, it was incredible. It was one of the best semesters of my entire college career. Um, so much fun. You know, you kind of just set up and, and practice or play at a field. Um, it doesn't have all that, that, that pomp and circumstance of like, you know, a big college game, game day feel, but it's fun. And we, we kind of personal. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. Like you can't just pile into the back of people's pickup trucks. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't that safe at the time, but you just you do whatever you could. That's the best way, though. That's that's how exactly. it really, truly goes with a certain level of life danger and traveling. I yeah, that's yeah. How you get to know your teammates the best. Real talk. Yeah. No, it was. It, it was exactly that. And and I, ironically, I mean, the, the two guys, two of them that I've, that I've stayed most in touch with. I'll give them a shout out, Jeff and Danny. Um, I've stayed in contact with them right through to, to present day. I mean, they're, they're two of my closest friends and they're guys I played rugby with. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it was incredible. And then I think, you know, sort of coming up to LA afterwards and I was kind of just doing various things. And then, uh, yeah, it was bartending. And, and, a, and a co-worker told me about a, um, a movie, a rugby movie he was auditioning for. And they went out and like had to do drills and so forth as part of the audition. And I don't know, I, I didn't go at first. And then... Um, he, he got in touch with me again about a month later and said they were still looking for, you know, the, the lead role, the right. Kil Kilgore role. And uh, I said, okay, that sounds interesting. And so he put me in contact with the, um, with the writer and producer, Al Deacon. And he was flying out the next day, flying from LA back to, to Boston, I believe. So wait, so, before I, sorry to interrupt. So kind of leading into that moment though. So for one, what college did you end up going to? I went to San Diego State. San Diego State. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah um, it was great. So, you know, whenever you were doing it then, whenever you started with the rugby club then, was it just rugby that you were doing or were you acting too at that point? Not at the time. I mean, I was doing, a few, I was doing some theater classes at school, more just kind of to fulfill the, the credit requirement. Right. But, I mean, no, my, my, my focus was purely just on, especially that last semester, just, just playing rugby and having fun. I did the absolute bare minimum credit wise because I, i'd pretty much done everything i needed to graduate so i thought all right. right well you have to have a minimum to be in school so i took i think it was like one economics class theater there's another class called challenges of leisure so i think that kind of says it all in terms of you know how difficult my, my academic class right there <laughs> it was difficult i think ironically i got a b but i don't want to i don't want to kind of dig that up i had trouble with leisure um but yeah it was um yeah just basically all rugby yeah. Um, when I wasn't doing that, I was kind of, I think I was working part time just on the side. Um, but yeah, it was it was a pretty pretty laid back semester. It was great, great way to kind of finish the college career. Makes but sense. I wasn't wasn't really doing much acting at the time. It wasn't until I graduated and thought, um, well, my plan was to move to Los Angeles and, and pursue, which I did. So, so where'd the acting bug come for you? Like, if, even though doing the little bit of theater that you'd had, like what? actually what was it that was like you know what let me give this a try versus you know maybe other other yeah, yeah definitely i mean that would come directly from my dad so my dad's an actor has been uh my entire life um so kind of always being around it yeah. um would be w where the you know the interest first started not really you know from a, uh, a standpoint of wanting to do it myself but it was just very familiar i mean i would i would see him rehearsing scenes i would go with him to auditions and, and various you know, casting houses or studio lots. I would, when he was doing a job, I'd go on set, but I always tell people I wouldn't be there watching everything. I'd usually be over in the corner, like playing with a ball. <laughs> I, I was just all about sports. Um, but as I got older, especially towards the end of my college career, that's when I kind of got the interest in, in acting. And yeah. I didn't really want to, at the time, pursue a career in, in business or finance. I just wanted to do something different. And so I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll move to Los Angeles and I'll, um, I'll try my hand. And uh, that's how it all kind of came about. And then, of course, I took classes and, and enrolled in, in different performance um, programs. But again, most of those were mostly for the credit and not necessarily like I was just trying to go and maybe aim in that direction. In, in college, yeah. But once I, once I decided to move to Los Angeles, yeah. yeah, I definitely took it seriously. I mean, I definitely started enrolling in programs, you know, specifically based on being a successful working actor. Um, you know, so what was that back in 2005, 2006? Right. You know, I, I always find it interesting, especially whenever it comes with people who have moved places, because mm. a lot of people are very fearful when it comes to making these jumps, especially to a place like LA, where you have so much, uh, there's just so many stimuli that go along there, right? Mm. For mm. you, did you feel like there's always been this natural inclination for mobility? Because you're talking about, moving from Australia over to Cali, then San Diego State, then up to LA. Uh, you know, these are 
for what I mean, obviously the Australia one, not so much in your control, but yeah. everything from there, do you feel like that you've always been a person that's kind of uh, maneuvering, trying to always kind of find a different place mobility wise or? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've actually moved several times since um, also. I mean, I've gone um, uh, in 2009, I moved back to Australia, then um, ended up moving to Montreal. Mm-hmm. for a year then then moved back to australia again for um for several years and I, I moved back to to los angeles in in 2015 nice so yeah i do kind of have this um nomadic sort of lifestyle mm-hmm. this way if you will not sure if it's a good thing or not i think you know at some point you kind of have to you know lay down some roots and and you know get serious about things but i mean i've enjoyed it uh, yeah it, it comes with its own challenges because i think you're always kind of hitting the reset button um, but there's also that sense of adventure that comes with it and, and pulling up your bootstraps and just, just finding a way to make it work. Um, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, yes, it's, it's happened a lot and I think I'm just used to it now. Um, I kind of get that itch after several years of like, okay, what's next? Where am I, where am I going to move on to? No, I completely understand the feeling. Like I, I've always had that same experience too. Like as a kid, I think we moved three times at least minimum as a kid. And then I've moved another two or three times after that between states. And then, of course, once you start traveling, it ends up into a whole different realm of, mm. of adventures. But I think the reason why I ask as well is I think there's always a relation to one's uh, ad- attraction to rugby as well because mm. I feel like rugby has always been something that's allowed a certain level of mobility in mm. it just because of the nature of the sport. It's, it's transient, whether it's from a cultural standpoint, country to country, or whether it's from just club to club, but there's still that element where it's like, all right, we're, we're siphoning through these unusual crowds and I have to be able to re, uh, reshape myself to be able to affixate my, to, I guess, fit into what that crowd is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think the one great thing about rugby, um, like in a lot of sports, but rugby in particular, is that um, it does very much have like a unifying spirit. Right. Um, and I, I think it's so common that you you... You travel somewhere, so you know. Say we're based here in Los Angeles, but we're traveling to, to another city, another state. It's commonplace. You go there, you know, you you play the game, but afterwards, there's not this animosity. It's like, okay, great, let, let's bond, let's go to dinner, lunch, you know, whatever you want to do. Like, there, there's that unifying bond, and I think that's kind of a universal thing with rugby across the world. I think that just comes part and parcel with the game, which I think is beautiful, because yes, yeah, so to your point, rugby is very nomadic. Um, you do travel. Um, throughout the world to play but it does really bring people together and especially in a place where it's not you know the tier one sport i mean right, in america exactly. you've got all, all the big sports rugby to its credit has grown tremendously in what the last 20 years um but it's still competing against you know all the all the major major sports you know the, the football the basketball the baseball you name it um so it does still stand out uh, in an incredible way but it, it just brings people together in ways that I haven't seen other sports. So I think that's, um, that's an incredibly special aspect to it. No, I, I feel the same. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I even started doing all this stuff was that attachment to the community aspect of it. There's, there's like you said, that uniquely trended rugby culture that goes along with it. Um, mm. That sometimes I don't even feel gets promoted as well within it. And, and you might be able to kind of touch on this because of the fact that you have the varying versions of, rugby for Australia to against the USA and even to mm-hmm. some extent within Canada. But I've always felt like there's that, that cultural element that n- never fully got promoted. We always talk about it like camaraderie and stuff like that, but it mm-hmm. never gets fully promoted. And I wonder if sometimes it impacts its ability to push past that, you know, fledgling sport mode here in the U S where, you know, maybe in, in Australia or UK, you've been able to see some of those elements. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think having to compete with sort of the, the grassroots level sports here mm-hmm. uh, it is very difficult, you know, for, for, you know, rugby to kind of grow um, in the States the way that basketball and, and baseball and football do. Because, I mean, again, I, I didn't move here until I was 14, but, you know, from what I can understand is the earliest sports that most people play are one of those three or, or maybe soccer. Right. But when you're in, a, when you're in Australia, it's, it's, it's usually rugby. Or, or cricket. People still play soccer too, but like rugby is the biggest one. So you do have that kind of junior level 
um, where it's just kind of ingrained in you um, to kind of play at such a, an early age. And, and as you grow, it's just there's that unifying bond that we talked about earlier. Right. I think even more so in countries like New Zealand and, and England and, and South Africa, um, it's becoming even more potent. I mean, again, I, I don't live in Australia anymore, but I still kind of keep tabs on, on the rugby world. And unfortunately, sort of rugby union is sort of Starting having to- second fiddle to, to rugby league, to, um, to their major league soccer program. Um, so I know there is a concern there about like, what is the future of Australian rugby? Um, you know, I couldn't say, I, you know, I feel bad kind of saying this, um, but you know, I tend to follow more rugby league now myself just because I've heard most Australians do. I have one of my friends, uh, he's an Australian guy who lives in Malaysia. And he told me the same thing. He was like, mm. you know, I like rugby union, but rugby league, like it, it yeah. feels like there's a different, uh, a more connective energy for yeah. Australians with rugby league than it has been with rugby union, I guess, the last five years. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know why it is. I, mean, I, I know I kind of got out of the interest of rugby union several years ago just because I found, like, you know, the rules were changing. It was becoming way too over-officiated. It didn't have the same flow of games. So it didn't hold, you know, the same appeal to me. Whereas with rugby league, it's, it's similarly structured to American football. You know, you've got the, mm. the five or, or so tackles and you have to kick it. So it's the constant back and forth. It just, it's got a, a better energy to it, in my opinion. Right. So I think that's why I personally kind of gravitate towards it and, and probably others do it uh, in the same regard. No, I, I, that, it makes sense. It makes sense. I, again, we, I see it. I, I know for me personally, it's still, like I feel like that's, it's, it's that ingrained, uh, enemy is the wrong word. But that little brother that you're just like, I can't, I can't let you have this. Not yet. Mm-hmm. But you also know, yeah, you're also kind of dope. But I don't want you to know this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You can appreciate it, but I'm not going to tell you I like you. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So uh, kind of getting back to, within the acting component, I, I wanted to know. So obviously when the acting world, we've heard a lot of things in terms of like the difficulty when it comes to roles, the difficulty when it comes to connecting. For you, when you moved out to L.A., having known the background that you had through your father, like, what was your experience kind of initially as you entered into that acting field in L.A.? Um, it was kind of just jumping into a field that I didn't really know too much about. It was kind of trial by fire, if you will. <laughs> Best way to learn. <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I mean, I went into it with a pretty, pretty positive attitude. Like, every audition I, I went into, I was like, oh, I've definitely got that role. I'm, def- I'm, I'm definitely getting that. Uh, I didn't get any of them. But... Um, no, I, I, uh, I don't know. I just went into it with kind of an open mind. And at first, I just, I, I remember my, um, my mate Danny, he would take me to his, uh, his castings. Yeah. And I wouldn't be on the list, but I just write my name in anyway. They usually call me in. So it was just kind of just a great way to kind of get experience with the audition process um, and kind of just being able to kind of finagle my way into the room. Right. Which I think is important. Um, I also worked at a British pub down in Santa Monica, the King's Head Tavern. And the great thing about that place is just so humble. And a lot of people um, from, from Britain and Europe who just kind of like, you know, um, career bartenders, waitresses and so forth. So it didn't have the same kind of everyone's an actor, everyone's in the industry feel. It was just kind of, it was a great sort of escape from everything. So even to this day, I, I maintain close relationships with people there. That, that was very, um, very important for me at the time. Um, but yeah, I think once I started sort of, taking you know programs and, and courses and, and acting lessons that's when i really kind of got serious because you know i mean it's it's los angeles actors are more than a dime a dozen <laughs> and and you're competing with with professional actors from from all over the world right um so you know it's not realistic to think that yeah you just show up and you're gonna get work you know it does it does take a lot of, a lot of you know hard hard lessons learned it takes a lot of yourself you know hard work i mean it's um it's, it's a major investment. Man, and look, I mean, clearly as it's, it's investment as well as a, a certain level of luck that it seems. Because even as you talk about how you received a role from playing, for play now with a guy you met in Starbucks and another guy that you met mm. in a random place, like it's, it doesn't always confluence together in the way that you would initially imagine or what always seems to be portrayed in, you know, uh, shows and not whatnot. Go up, do your audition, 
and then they, yeah. they love you or they hate you. And maybe it's a little well, bit. Like, like I said, this one was, was incredibly serendipitous. You know, I, um, again, you know, my mate told me about it and I wasn't receptive at first. And then he put me in touch again. And, you know, I, I just went to meet the producer and the writer in, in the lobby. Didn't prepare anything. It was more just like, hey, what's going on? Like, you're doing a movie about rugby. <laughs> he asked me a bit about myself. He, I think he asked me more about actual rugby than an acting <laughs> ability. He asked me about things like, well, how far can you kick it? You know, what's your... um you know, your, your range for, for drop goals and so forth. Yeah. Um, so that was cool, just kind of just a talk shop with rugby. And then um, I went and met the director, his, his partner at at, uh, at Starbucks, and we just kind of chatted there. And and, um, and then I know I had to give an audition. They wanted to kind of see, you know, my, my acting chops. I was like, <laughs> all right. And, of course, the role is Scottish. So I decided the best course of action would – I'd drive over to my dad's place and, and we'd, um, we'd film some of the audition sides. So I basically spent about, you know, three or four hours just watching all the Scottish, you know, material that I could watch. So I, I watched right. Braveheart, Train Spotting. Um, I don't know, there's probably something else along there. I'm just basically trying to sort of, you know, replicate the accent. And then we ended up filming it and I don't know how, but they you know, Al and, and Dave, Al Deacon and Dave's story, they responded to it and, and called me back. So I I I if I watched the sides now I'd be appalled. It was um <laughs> not my best performance, but it got me the job and, and everything, you know, the rest is history. So like when you, when they were talking to you about it, like what actually kept sparking? Was it just like, Hey, I want to get a job or was there something actually in the script that kind of sparked you into being like, okay, this, this might be a role that, that I can take enough to try and mimic the worst voice of Scottish for mm. uh, in Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, remembering that I was a, at the time, a struggling actor. So any role that I could, I could wrap my head around, I was like, nice. of course, I def I'm definitely in. So that, so that was big. But then um, the fact that it was about rugby and I was just shortly, you know, a, a short time before I had just finished my rugby career. So I still kind of like had that hankering to, to play. Nice. Um, and then it was just also a great role, a great story. Um, you know, it was, you know, just, just this young guy trying to find himself and, and kind of ostracizing a lot of people and, and getting out in his own two feet. It just seemed, I don't know, just cool. And, um, you know, they just seemed like really good blokes too, which they are. Right. And they, everything about it, everything that they learned about um, the, the script, the role, the people involved, you know, where we were going to be filming. I mean, of course, the appeal of filming in Kansas City in Scotland. Right. I mean, I'm not going to say no to that, no matter what the story is, but... Um, every, really? yeah, no. What? <laughs> no way. Of course. <laughs> um but yeah, no, it was, there was not one thing about it right, that made me you know, concerned or, or pause for concern. It was like, I'm in hundred percent. Let's go. Lord. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful. When you went to Scotland for that, whenever you initially went to Scotland and, and, and were doing that role, was that your first time going over to the UK in general or? No, because my dad's from Wales. Okay. Um, so I'd spent a considerable amount of time kind of going back to Wales with him or to visit family. And then, um, uh, having gone to uh, to England multiple times with him, because that's where my, my grandmother's side's from, right. um, have since gone back to Ireland, uh, which I love. So, I mean, I've, I've done pretty much all of it. I mean, I, it's an incredible place. Uh, but, yeah, that was my first time in Scotland. Nice. I have to say, I, I, I'd always – okay, so when it comes to Welsh, all right, I need to at least put this out here. So I always knew Wales, obviously, as being part of the UK. All right, mm. this is going to sound offensive, but bear with me. I just learned this recently. I sure. did not realize how culturally um, unique the Welsh culture was. Mm. It wasn't until this last Rugby World Cup that I even knew that Welsh was an actual language in and of itself. Mm. Uh, on top of it, because I'd always known it as like, um, again, this is going to sound bad from what I understand. Uh, but I always thought it was just like a better sounding English. Like, I mm. thought that was the Welsh language within that. So when I found out, uh, we, we were doing a little bit of uh, filming, and this family for the Wales versus Australia game at the R R Rugby World Cup, and mm. we were outside the stadium filming, and this family came with the flower, ro the rose, and all, all the get-up, and then sang us this song in Welsh. I was like, wait, this is, this is a whole completely different language. Like, it's not, like, you know different accents of English. This is yeah. its own. 
is that something that okay is that something that you tapped into having the fact that you had gone back like do you speak welsh welsh i, I don't really speak welsh i mean there's one there's the long train station um which i can say which is uh and i'm probably butchering this so i apologize to any welsh followers uh but it's uh um so you'll have to Excuse me, because I can't give you the actual um, description of what I just said. But if you just look up longest train station in the world, that's what it is. Um, nice. But yeah, the, the Welsh culture is, is um, very rich in tradition and pride. Mm. Um, you know, I believe that the, um, the Welsh language is, you know, they're all kind of branches of kind of spin-offs of Gaelic and different right. versions of it. Um, and I know there's a big push to, um, to basically start teaching uh, Welsh again uh, um, to the younger generations. Otherwise, it's going to become kind of a lost language. Uh, but I, I do believe there's success there. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a very beautiful place, beautiful people. There's a real harmony. Right. Uh, it's almost poetic in the way they talk. Um, yes. I was yeah. going to say, it was very sing-songy. Not even the song. I'm talking mm. just in terms of uh, the flow of pattern of, of mm. when they talk. Like you said, it, it like I said, it was, it was very sing-songy, which I appreciated. It was something that I could recognize uh, a little bit when it comes to some of the Nigerian languages that I, mm. I've interacted with, where yeah. it's yeah, you know, where it just it hit the pattern. And it's sweet to the ears, I guess, to say the least. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you know, um, the Welsh and Irish are kind of similar in that regard. Right. The kind of poetic language. You know, Scottish is a bit more has that um, the Scottish brogue. Um, you know, which which kind of sets that apart. Um, but yeah, it's it's a beautiful language. I wish I did know more. Um, outside of the train station that's kind of you know the the limitation to to what i can say um, I but i i love it it's it's in, um a wonderful wonderful place and beautiful people no no i i got it i just had to put that out there because i was like look i finally got someone who's at least been and from wales consistently mm -hmm. let me let me reveal this new knowledge no, for of me. course i'm glad you did it's, it's it's building more awareness for the welsh people so when you got into Scotland, like what was that acting like? Because even the guy that you had that was playing your father, I, I've seen him in other places before, in other films. I, I couldn't put my finger on it. But like mm. for you, like what was it like, you know, acting with that guy? Because he was intense. Like he mm. seemed intense. Well, um, he'll he'll love to to hear that, and I'll let him know because that's my, actually my dad in real life. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's um that's Chad Chad Hayward. Um, so yeah, that's that's my yeah, that my sense. dad in real life, and that and that was a great experience too. I mean, um, you know, he's done a tremendous amount of work, but I think even he considers that one of his favorite experiences because we got to work together. Um, and I like to think I kind of uh, gave my two cents because at the time I I got um you know hired for the role, they hadn't cast that. Yeah, and um you know I kept kind of mentioning you know well my dad you know he could play. You know, he could play the role, and and uh, and Alan Dave kind of came on board with it. So next thing I knew, he um he was my dad, and he grew out his beard, so we could have the big you know the the big chops. <laughs> um, so that that was great. I mean, it was it was great working with him. Um, you know, it's a very very tense relationship between those two characters. So I think right. in in some respects, it kind of it made the relationship between my dad and I even in that much more intense in a good way. Yeah, um, it kind of like fueled the the uh, motion because there's like some intense scenes between us. Um, you know, kind of when he gives me the bag at, at the end. Um, I think I think the most daunting thing for me when we got to Scotland was actually speaking Scottish. Honestly. My my iteration of Scottish <laughs> in front of Scottish people, and I, I remember it very distinctly. Is it, the day we flew in, we we drove straight to Melrose. Um, and there was an actual game there and we were kind of just, you know, there for the experience. I don't even know if we filmed anything that day, but the whole kind of crew had come up from, from the U S yeah. we were there and there was, um, I, I was, I was by the, 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 the grandstand kind of going to, you know, the canteen or locker room maybe. And there was two Scottish guys and they said, Oh, you're, um, you're here for the movie. <laughs> they were obviously saying in their Scottish, Scottish accent. I said, yeah, yep. Yeah. And they're like, who do you play? Because they'd heard about it. I was like, oh, I play, you know, the, the lead character. And they're like, well, you're supposed to be from Scotland, yeah? I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. They said, well, go on. Give me your best, best Scottish accent. I was so on the spot. But 
I, I gave them a bit of a line and, and they kind of just looked at each other, looked at me and they nodded and they kind of gave their, their nod of approval. They said, not bad, not bad. So after that, it kind of, I'm glad that happened the first day. I felt a, a big w- uh, wave of relief because <laughs> my accent had been accepted by the locals. It's been passed. You are passable. Yeah. You know. Yeah. If they said the- that's that's a joke, <laughs> you're out of here. I would have uh, I would have had a, lot, a bit of an issue doing the remainder of the scenes. It, I would have felt a bit a little awkward. I've been like, look, guys, you know, you know, just just don't take the insult too heavily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, but that's we'll dub good. it. We'll dub it. Don't worry. Right. <laughs> mm. No, like, I, I always find it interesting, especially whenever it's doing those accents. And, and for you, obviously, you, the method you used int- was uh, interesting. Did you end up having a moment where you were just, like, practicing with your dad, going back and forth, just trying to see whose Scottish accent could be the most Scottish between the two of y'all? Um, not re- I mean, like, we, we, we had a very different preparation. I mean, because for the most part, while he was preparing, I was, I was in Kansas City. Okay. Filming, uh, and then I remember there was there was a short break where I came back for a couple of days, and then we were on separate flights, and we met in New Jersey because from New Jersey that was a connecting flight to Scotland. So that was, I don't think we really kind of had any sort of you know scene preparation or, or, or um, interactions regarding our Scottish accents or the scenes in general until we got to Scotland. You know, we prepared very very separately. Um. But yeah, it was it was just one of those things we kind of just fell into, and again, being that it was actually my dad, it not to sound cliche, but like it just wasn't acting. It was just kind of just interacting. You know, once you get the lines down, yeah, we're just right. kind of just going back and forth with each other, um, which was which was lovely. I mean, it was, it was one of the one of the points in the film where I felt so invested in the role, and where it wasn't it wasn't me kind of like right, how do we want to do this scene, so forth. It was just like let's just be. Um, yeah, what one of my and, and throughout my entire acting career, that was one of the, the most some of the most real feelings I, I felt, you know, while being on camera. And I can feel that. I, I, I was I was gonna say, like, was there ever, whenever you started acting, a concept of a possibility that you felt you could have a chance to act with your dad in a role? Was it something that you maybe had aimed for? Maybe not, maybe primarily aiming for, but in the mm-hmm. back of your mind, kind of, hey, I would, this would be kind of cool to do. Uh, um, at, yeah, yeah. Well, at that point, no, because I was, it was, you know, one of my first roles. So at that point, you know, we would, I would usually go to him when I had an audition and we would do that together, um, which was cool. You know, it was great to, you know, have someone doing the scene with me who I trust, you know, implicitly. Right. Um, but it was, at that point, it wasn't, you know, all right, this is what we should work towards. It just kind of just happened um, organically, which was great. And we, we have had the opportunity to do a couple more things together. Nice. Um, we, did, we did a few plays, um, a few scenes on stage, which was nice. So, uh, yeah, it's it's been great. I've really uh, really enjoyed being able to work with him a couple of times. Man, and I can imagine, like you said, it, it seems to have been able to continue to bring you guys closer because there's a. It's almost like again traveling with somebody. Like if you're mm-hmm. sharing a scene, like that emotional, the emotions that are already supposed to be set for any scene are can already be intense, depending obviously on the role. But to have yeah. that father son one, and then to be able to we have something similar like that in other instances. I have to imagine that the relationship between you guys are incredibly strong. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you know, the fact that it, it's my dad in real life, I'm sure amplified the scene even more. I mean, I, I can't say what it would be like if it was just another actor, you know, playing mm-hmm. my dad. Um, who knows? But yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, my dad and I are incredibly close. I'm, I'm close to both my parents. And, um, you know, again, the fact that I was able to do it with him and, you know, experience that, that real emotion just uh, was, was incredible. And, and I'm very thankful for it. Man, that's dope. Mm. So when you guys got to Kansas City, because this is the one that's interesting because of the fact, one, you guys were in uh, Arrowhead Stadium for, mm. you know, and then I always wondered whenever I first saw it, because um, I think at, actually at that time, there had been a movie that was done here in, in Louisiana that had, um, I can't remember his name now, but he was one of the actors from Twilight, but he had played a rugby role out here, and they had essentially tried to bring us as a club to come play as extras and part of that, right? Mm -hmm. When it got to the Kansas City uh, stuff, and I was watching it, I was like, did you guys guys tap into the clubs in those areas to be able to... uh, 
to fill as a competition or how'd that work? Well, yeah, I mean, we definitely did. Um, Dave Story, the director, he is, um, he's from Kansas City. Um, I should, sorry, I should say Kansas because I know we stayed with his family in Kansas, but we filmed the majority in Kansas City. Um, but, yeah, I know, we, um, I know we played against the Kansas City Blues. Nice. Which, uh, as, as far as I know, is one of the major, major programs in, um, in the Midwest and obviously Kansas City. Um, so there is, I know there's a major scene there where they're kind of like the big team that, you know, uh, the ragtag group of, um, of our team goes and plays, uh, the Wanderers, that's it. Um, yeah, so we went and played them, but it was great. I mean, I, I remember it vividly because we were at their home field and, um, you know, we were just kind of like, you know, a, a group of actors. I, I don't really recall if that many of, of the guys in the Wanderers had a history of rugby or I think there was a few that kind of played sparingly, but majority of them had played like, you know, football or some other sports. So everyone was kind of still picking up as we went along. But then um, all the guys who played for the Blues showed up and, and it kind of felt like they came into it with a mindset of like, all right, it's game day. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, all right, guys, just like, let's calm it down. Just remember we're filming here. So it's... Um, it's never serious. Easy, yeah, easy, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. Ease up on the tackles. You know, it doesn't need to be a full go. But um, look, I, I think, you know, in retrospect, that was fantastic and actually helped a lot because um a lot of the intensity is real and say. like some some of the backline plays um you know some some of the scrum sets the line outs like a lot of that like we filmed it in a very real capacity i mean there's one kickoff scene where i don't know if we we kind of mapped it out you know in terms of what would happen it was more just like all right kickoff and i know harry frith the dp um was incredible he was at the back um by the try line mm-hmm and then it felt like they didn't call cut for about two minutes. <laughs> so we're basically just playing rugby for about two minutes and, and everyone seemed to enjoy it. I had a great time. You know, it felt like being back on the, on the field. Nice. Um, so I think that's why a, a lot of the scenes do look very real um, is because they did let us kind of play for a little while. I mean, some of those hits, you know, were, were actual hits and you felt them afterwards. I mean, I, I was, I was going to say, because I, I know uh, what you call it. I think the, the guy who played Henry, the, the ball guy, um, mm. whenever he was, uh, what you call it, whenever he was going in for those goals, especially in like that last scene where he's just running down the field. I know it's, I know obviously it was a lot of cut scenes, but my part of my mind was like, how many times did he have to get, how many times did he get accidentally hit to make sure that that dive at the end was going to be like legitimate? um to 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 win the game overall you know mm. like it was it was those kind of like the 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 feeling of it the intensity yeah of it. yeah well like i said i mean they definitely let us play um uh in in certain respects or or even if they'd set up a scene i remember one time you know when we were in scotland um they wanted to get like uh, a very kind of real feeling of, of you know tackling someone into the sidelines so we literally just filmed like 10 to 20 takes of of tackling someone into the sideline and, and, you know, they were real hits, you know, not to the point where it's like American football where you're smashing into each other. Like right. we're basically taking out the person's legs, but you know, those, those are real, you know, the person's running, the person's running at least like, you know, three quarters of full speed. So no um, doubles for you guys. No, I, um, <laughs> I, remember, I remember one in particular, there were, um, it was when we were in Scotland and we're playing the local team. I want to say it was like the Watsonians or something like that. Um, but it was in Edinburgh and this was, a, you know, in the story, I'm going back to play my former team. Right. And so I'd spotted them. And so they were like very, there's a lot of angst against me. They wanted like payback. And so the scene was, I had to run along the sideline and, you know, they set up like, you know, a gymnastics mat next to the sideline. Right. But there was just a line of players and, and I, each one would just take the turn, just kind of absolutely annihilating me with a tackle <laughs> into the mat. And they, they didn't hold back. Like these, these tackles, like I'm talking about like picking up, like hammering down and thank God for that, Matt. Otherwise I would have, uh, I would have been a lot worse shape. Um, you know, I remember, I remember there was one where I thought I'd broken my nose, um, which would have been wow. disastrous because there's only so much makeup that you can do to kind of cover that up. But right. thankfully it wasn't, it wasn't anything bad, but yeah, a lot of that was, like a lot of that was real. It, it killed. <laughs> It really could. But, hey, it looks great on camera, so that's all that matters. I mean, look, you know, do it for the performance. Do it for the performance. I love it. Yeah, I'm a committed actor. That's, that's <laughs> what it comes down to. You know, so I, I always say, like, 
he, there was two movies that really set the pacing in, in that time in 2010. It was Forever Strong that was, I guess, made in 05. That mm. seemed to be, the, for American cinema specifically. There was Forever Strong that I think, I, I feel like every first time rugby player like, gets told, check this movie out. And then mm. there was Play On that became the first one that I felt was an independent movie that was made in the U.S. You know, mm. Obviously not mm. a big studio movie, but it looked like there was dedication, passion, and love that went into it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, whenever it, it comes to those situations like that, like, I don't know, I've looked at some of the movies that you, you've played in, but, you know, for you, do you feel th that you felt that you have played in? Do you feel like there is a certain uh, higher level of commitment that goes into these passion projects a little bit more because of the fact that, there seems to be a much more uh, emotional desire to make it rather than maybe a pure financial one. So it makes it a little bit more. Yeah, w w without a doubt. I mean, there was a huge, um, you know, investment of time that was required of, of certain individuals. And, you know, again, for me, it wasn't, it was, it was fairly straightforward. I mean, I, you know, my job at the time was, was bartending and, and, you know, you know, the people there are so wonderful. They said, yeah, by all means go and, and do we have to do. But I mean, like some, some of the guys on the team, I mean, you know, they have families, they have careers, um, you know, where it's, it's essentially nine to five. So you're basically asking these individuals to take vacation time, be away from their families. Right. Um, and that was a, lo a lot of pressure. And, you know, the fact that this was a passion project from, from Al and Dave, um, who basically, I know, I know Al kind of wrote, wrote the whole thing with Dave and, and they produced it um, and, and, you know, directed it. And I know Ivan who plays that Argentinian uh, character, he would fly in um, frequently from Florida because that's where, he, you know, he lived and, and that's where his family's based and he had a job down there, has a job. So, yeah, it was, it was a big sacrifice um, for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there were, there were some times filming where it was basically, <clears throat> let's just figure out how to do it. Like, let's get it done. Maybe the first idea that we had in mind um won't work but we just kind of figure out a solution and that's where the genius of harry harry frith came into play is he was just kind of he was always just able to come up with the most incredible um solves to issues I and mean, one of the most talented you know filmmakers i've ever worked with um so yeah to, to answer your question i do think it takes a lot more investment you know, personal like right. you know, i'm not talking financially here but just like a personal um you know, sacrifice to get these kind of projects done um, because you don't have that backing of, of a studio or, or like, you know, the big financials. It's, it's up to you to, to make it all work. How long did it take you guys to finish that film? To film well, the... Yeah. Um, I want to say we're in Kansas City and I, I, we actually filmed it, I believe, in 2006 and seven. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so this yeah, has been so a it, long time being made. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I believe we're in Kansas City for, I mean, don't quote me on this, but it was somewhere between like five to seven weeks. So let's go okay. with six. And then, yeah, we, we all came back to, well, the people who were based in Los Angeles came back. And I think it was maybe less than a week. And then we all got on a plane to Scotland. And I want to say that was uh, maybe a, a week to 10 days of, of filming there. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I remember around that two-month mark, probably, probably a little bit under it. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, that's not mm. too bad, though. But that's good. That's it's it's impressive still within within that much time to be able to uh, to cram in a lot because obviously you are trying to make the most of every minute of every hour mm. and trying to make it work. Well, and, and just just the, the the avenues they were able to kind of open up to to film. I mean, you know, getting into to Murrayfield in in Edinburgh. I mean, that's kind of like that's holy land. You know, right. regarding Scottish rugby. So to be able to get access um, to film in there and get on the pitch and to have Gavin Hastings involved, who's essentially like, you know, the, um, the god of rugby in Scotland. Yep. I mean, th those, aren't, those aren't small things. And I think that's what really kind of sets this film apart is, is to have that accessibility uh, and makes it a lot more real. You know, I, I, you know, I, I referenced to this last Rugby World Cup simply because it was so, you know, recent. But, you know, one, one thing I felt, even in Japan, there's something about being on that, uh, on, even if it's not necessarily historic, but the field where you know that there is massive action, massive 
and very, uh, um, I guess the word is, uh, consequential action that will happen mm. on the field. It's almost like an energy that comes mm. off from it. When you're inside, say, uh, Arrowhead Stadium, and you're inside uh, uh, at Mary Marydale, like, did you feel like, man, I have a responsibility to make sure I portray this well because this honor of being able to be in this, this arena in this way? Mm. Um, look, I think, you know, speaking purely for Murrayfield, for this example, like it didn't, it, it just brought out naturally. Just, just being, you know, such a, a rugby head growing up and, and you know, knowing the history of all the, the test matches that took place on, on that pitch, that stadium, it just it already gives you a sense of like, this is incredible. So, you know, it, it, it didn't really take much acting. It was just like, I'm just going to go out there and be because I'm honored <laughs> to be on, to be on this grass. And like, and you walk out in the grass and it's just, it's got a different feel. I mean, right. I, I'm sure that the groundskeepers, uh, you know, I think that's a full-time job kind of taking care of that because it's, it's the softest grass. Um, it's just, it's got that air of, of energy just being in that stadium. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was really something. And, and just, because I was, I was there with some of the, um, the local rugby players that, we, um, that were part of the project too, and we were kind of just throwing the ball around, kicking it, and just, I don't know. It, it, it's, um, most people don't get that opportunity uh, to do that. So I, I definitely didn't take it for granted. I was, I was thankful to be able to do that. Dude, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Mm. So after you got done with play on, you know, what, what were you able to take out from that moving on to the next step for you? Um, I don't think I've, I've worked on a project since that had the same sense of camaraderie, mm -hmm. um, with everyone. I mean, I've, I've been very lucky to be involved in some incredible projects and, and also, you know, you build relationships respective to those, but that group of people, um, what we're able to kind of pull off, um, in that, in that time frame, And as I was referencing before, kind of like, you know, the, the unexpected things that come up. And then you kind of just get forced to figure out a solution. It was just such a bonding experience. And um, that was the most special project I've ever worked on. Really? Um, yeah, with, without a doubt. It was just, you know, it was, um, it just had an air of, air of magic about it. And, you know, we, we, we chat every now and then, like, you know, uh, myself and, and various individuals on the film, and you know, we kind of just rehash some of the memories. Um, but I just, just remember it being kind of, yeah, one of the most fav one of my most favorite projects I've ever worked on my entire career. Dude, that's so dope. That's so mm -hmm. dope. I would probably argue say this is probably the one that would stand out the most just because of how, not even unique as it was uh, just from experiencing it, but I think even in terms of the, the historical factors of it being in this very young, what I would like to call young rugby cinematic uh, mm. string of uh, events because it's not very many. I, I, I've looked it up. It's not mm. very many mm. rugby movies. <laughs> no, there's, there's not. Um, and and I'm, I'm honored to be part of, you know, one of the very few rugby films that are out there. Um, yeah, everything about it. I mean, from just being told about the film in the first place to meeting Alan and, and Dave and, and discussing the script all the way filming and, and to, to it being launched and, and debuted. It was um, everything about it has a sense of, of uh, you know, like I said, that magic, that, that specialness to it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it is one of the few. I haven't really seen too many other um, rugby films that have come out. I, in fact, I can't even name one outside of the other one you mentioned. So I probably need to get out there and, and do a bit of digging, but yeah. It really is digging. Like, um, it, it, it's funny. Um, when it comes to it, because I, I, I do particularly like my, my films, I mean, outside of, I think I would, I think probably the only other one that people would really know is Invictus. And then. Mm, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. For obvious reasons. Right. Yeah. But then whenever you start getting down into the nitty gritty of it, like it's either uh, other, either very independent films that are, are not well known, but you know, you see them here and there. I think there's like movies like Mercenary, which is French. Mm. Um, I think one that's probably the one of the greatest ever done, but it's the silliest of all time is Psy. And so you have yeah. like, I would, I would recommend checking it out. You're going to need subtitles, but you're just okay. going to laugh because it's, it out. it's yeah, 
it's it's Indian. It's it's Bollywood. It's a Bollywood rugby movie. So <laughs> it takes all the boxes. I'm I'm down. I'd love to watch it. You know, so it, it it's nice to be able to see like that cultural resonance across again. It's let alone already small enough to be able to have rugby movies, let alone American ones. And I think yours would count as one of three. I mean, you leave Invictus out of it because that's just that's a different that's a different range. Yeah. But one of three between the Nomads, Play On, and uh, Forever Strong. So yeah, to I'm uh, honored, uh, I'm honored to be a part of that list. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> you know, so. Kind of wrapping up, you know, what is it now? Like, what have you been able to do rugby stuff or been able to uh, obviously continue on with career as it was, moved on to bigger and better things? Like, for you, what, what's what been the next move since? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've, I've been lucky to, to work on, on several um, several projects in, in the years that have, that have happened, or evolved. Um, Kind of working more on the, on the business um, side of, of the production world now, so um, I think a lot of people kind of gravitate towards that in journey. Um, in terms of in terms of rugby, you know, I, I follow my my rugby league team back in Sydney, the Sydney Roosters, which are two time oh uh, two time Premiership winners. So going for a third, no big deal. No biggie. No biggie. Humble. No biggie. Humble, of course. <laughs> no biggie. They'll be fine. And then, um, ironically, I was. Um, I was at Dick's Sporting Goods the other day because I just I wanted to get a pump for my football, and they had like one of the big bins like with like the whole range of like basketballs, volleyballs, softballs, whatever, and just right on top was this brand new Gilbert, and it was pumped up perfectly, and without even thinking, I just grabbed it like that's mine, <laughs> and um, I've pretty much had it every time I walk in the house, I just grab it. And I'm kind of walking around with it, kind of you know reliving the glory days. So I've been going down to the park with my neighbour Nick and, and kind of just kicking it and, and throwing nice. it around. So. It's been nice to kind of get back into it. Look, slowly inoculate you back into the rugby world. Like, get, get yeah. on the pitch, man. I mean, get, get no, no, no. I'll probably be snapped like a twig if I went back out there. So I'll, um, I'm happy to be a spectator. Um, have you had a chance to, uh, to actually catch up with MLR or any of that that's been going on here in the U.S.? Uh, the local league or the, the American leagues? The professional league, right. Yeah, I mean, look, I kind of... I keep tabs to a certain degree. I, um, I, I do kind of I pay more attention to my, my college team or right. the club team. San Diego State? Uh, yeah, because the Aztecs have, have, have quite, a, quite a strong um, strong rugby team and I think their, their program has grown substantially over the last 15 years. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, you know, I, I keep tabs on them. Um, obviously, when you get big headlines of... of um, I don't, I don't think it's the MLR, but it was, uh, it's the team that's in Toronto. It might be Rugby League. I know Sonny Bill Williams um, went over there. The, um, uh, it's a it's dog like a Super League. It's like a Super League, I think, because I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I keep tabs. I, kind of, I enjoy reading the headlines. I know, was it Ma Nonu who went down to San Diego? Yeah. yeah so I, I was surprised they got some pretty big names, which was you know, fantastic for the league. Um, but I haven't really watched too much of it. I mean, look, man, you know, look, you're, you're already here. You know, you know I know. I mean, without a, I, have, I have no excuse. I do need <laughs> now to get LA back has it. a team, too. The Guiltinis, but, you know, whatever. It's still their name. I'll go check it out. I'll go check it out. <laughs> man, Adam, like, legitimately, I, I truly appreciate this. This was really no, of course. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm very um, grateful that you had me on the show. So thank you. Man, I thank you so much. Yo, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed being able to talk with Adam on this. Uh, literally great guy. Uh, definitely appreciate him for taking the time to get on the podcast and just talk a little bit and just give some background. I mean, uh, I hope it gives you a chance to hopefully go find it. I Like I said at the beginning, I do believe that this is on uh, Apple iTunes uh on apple movies uh or on amazon if i remember correctly and uh you know check it out it's it's definitely an independent film but it's incredibly endearing and it's incredibly heartwarming and uh nice to add to the few american rugby movies uh that are out there we know forever strong uh the nomads who i had james brunson on uh who leads the north philly nomads they did the movie about him and his group 
Uh, you can find that episode. And, of course, then there's Play On to be able to watch. That just speaks about the American rugby experience for now. Uh, so, you guys check it out. And appreciate you guys for definitely listening always uh definitely check out the other episodes that we have last week we did a bit of a throwback but an informational one with jackie finlan of the rugby breakdown um before that we had farah douglas of mount saint mary's rugby a great insightful uh interview uh we had rashad lipford the founder of north carolina a t the aforementioned james brunson of the north philly nomads Matthew Provost of Prairie View A&M, Nicholas Walcott, definitely check this one out on the Chicago uh, Griffins Rugby Club. Uh, we also had Chetta Emba, fullback for USA Rugby's 15s and 7s women's team. We had Ram Eddings of Idaho State and the founder of the Gray Wolves. We've had Charity Williams, Olympic medalist for Canada's uh, Rugby Sevens women. Uh, Saifedean Safir of Morehouse College and more Blaine Scully of USA Rugby. We've gotten so many great guests, so many great listens. I'm telling you, you want to hear this from beginning to end. It's well worth it. And once again, I appreciate you guys for taking the time to listen, coming back each week, taking up the time to participate and, and sh be able to just let me, you know, listen to me rant. So, uh, uh, Thank you very much, and uh, I want to just let you know, I hope that you guys have a great week. I hope that you guys stay happy. I hope that you guys stay healthy and let you know that you are absolutely highly favored. I'll talk to you guys next time. Cheers. <laughs>